we have a, a set of three uh, rather short presentations from some uh, uh, graduate students uh, working on cattle health problems. Um, and I think for this uh, part of the, um, what we'll do is we will uh, look at each presentation. Each, each of the students has taped the presentation just as uh, all everybody else has. I think we'll just, we'll look at each, all three of them. And then uh, at the end, we'll have all three presenters on for questions. Uh, so uh, we will start off with um, uh, a presentation by Dr. Matt Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott is a uh, 2018 graduate of Mississippi State, uh, following graduate uh, uh, of the vet school of receiving the DVM in 2018. He, um, following that, he he went right on to a PhD with Dr. Woolams, and Matt is uh, seeking a PhD in infectious disease with a, a minor in computational biology. He has an interest in the application of bioinformatics uh, in the discovery in the discovery of uh, biomarkers uh, involved in bovine respiratory disease. So we're going to go to Matt's presentation uh, directly. Soon to be PhD um, at Mississippi State University, and today I'll be talking about the identification and use of biomarkers, and specifically some of the research that we're we're doing now in order to better predict health and disease outcomes related. Uh, to bovine respiratory disease and high-risk stalker cattle. So the first question we need to ask is, what is a biomarker? What is it? What is it? And what does it indicate? And a biomarker, at least in my opinion, is is an objective biological indicator of some form of process, mechanism, or phenomenon that's relevant to a phenotype or a disease or a hazard of interest. And the first thing I included in this sentence is objective. So we, we base our approach, at least in practice and in medicine, around evidence-based medicine. And so this is something that needs to be uh, capable of being measured accurately and is reproducible. And so we base the outcome of these biomarkers and, and their validity towards whatever disease we're wanting to analyze based on some type of clinical endpoint. So an example of this would be the use of uh, creatinine indicating something like renal disease or dehydration in a serum chemistry. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, in bovine respiratory disease, we don't have really any reliable prospective biomarker in BRD. We have a lot of things that indicate disease after the fact, things like average daily gains, things like lung consolidation and lung lesions at times of necropsy, but we really don't have anything that can reliably predict when disease is going to occur. And I like to define the use and kind of the validity and identifying biomarkers with the kind of the five W's, the who, what, when, where, and why. So the first aspect of this is who should we even be testing? And, and of course, dealing with bovine respiratory disease, we're really interested in populations at risk. But how do we define that risk? So we can evaluate high risk groups, these animals that are coming in, that are being trailered across the country, may or may not be castrated. And so really the question that we need to be asking about these groups is how much disease do we expect to find? And then I think something that's often glossed over are these low risk groups, these background animals. And it's not a question of whether or not they're going to be uh, sick or that herd is going to come down disease, but how much disease within that herd setting do we tolerate? Um, and really, realistically, the ultimate question that we're asking with these biomarkers are who are the individuals that we are willing to spend time or money on in order to learn something about that will help us change the outcome or the way we interpret disease? So next is what? So what does that biomarker indicate? And really to understand that, we have to understand uh, what it is that we hope to gain from testing. So we uh, need to further evaluate and understand the process of disease and the basis of severity within the disease. And understanding that will help build some of the confidence in terms of the process or mechanism that's supposedly going to be represented by that biomarker. And next is the when. So when do we evaluate that biomarker? When should we be implementing this test once we have a biomarker or one that we're hoping to gain? And really that comes down to the disease timing. Are we trying to be proactive or are we trying to be reactive? Are we trying to predict a disease outcome? Are we trying to predict a phenotype? Are we trying to react to it? Are we trying to understand where they're at in terms of their uh, clinical evaluation and their clinical disease? 
And realistically, those biomarkers need to be able to understand and represent clinical endpoints. And we can only get that by gaining these three points. And I think that that comes down to understanding the normal biological process and pathophysiology of the disease in question, the relationship that that biomarker has with those clinical endpoints that we're interested in, such as the acquisition of BRD, um, and what the effects or, of an intervention are uh, once we gain that information from the biomarker. So next is where should I be testing? Where should I be looking uh, to obtain this biomarker from? And uh, one part of that is it comes down to the tissue type. So how invasive or easy is that sample to obtain? I deal a lot with whole blood samples and I like whole blood because they're, they're not very invasive samples, they're easy to obtain. Um, and they tell us a lot of information about what's happening within that animal from a multitude of different tissue sites and different organ sites. Thinking about it from kind of a CBC and chemistry platform, we use blood to make an evaluation of what's happening in the kidneys and the liver um, and, the, and the lung tissue and the brain. So it, it's, it's, this is a very applicable tissue type that we can use. Um, and next is what kind of animal type are we trying to test? So I put a picture up here of uh, a beef and uh, um, dairy cow calf. And I think this is really in illustrating the point that we don't need to just look at age and the sex of that animal, but realistically, we need to look at the breed as well. So beef versus dairy, we got to consider them realistically as separate species of livestock. Thinking about it in terms of their metabolic demands, they're vastly different in terms of their production output and, and life cycles. And so that kind of leads us into these population types, again, with the beef versus dairy discussion, but also with the stage of life. What aspect of life is that animal in? Uh, younger animals uh, versus animals that are in peak lactation versus dry animals in a dairy operation are all gonna have very different metabolic demands and may have different indications of disease at those time points. And so last, this is the why does it matter? And I think this is ultimately one of the most important questions to ask. Um, and that really comes down to what's the purpose of a diagnostic test. So if I have a biomarker, uh, knowing information about the biomarker, will I treat these animals any different with ultimately the outcome of a positive or negative test? And re realistically, does that diagnostic test change the approach of management or treatment for that animal? How much should I give trust in terms of that diagnostic tool? Has that, di has that biomarker been validated? What is the accuracy of that biomarker? And realistically, is it cost effective to use or is it even going to improve uh, the, the animal's welfare? Okay, so now we understand kind of the five W's of those biomarkers. So next is coming down and actually trying to obtain and evaluate those biomarkers as diagnostic tools. And that comes down to three major points. So first is the discovery of that biomarker. And to understand that, we have to really define what process we're interested in. And there's two major approaches in terms of driving experiment that's going to lead us to evaluating and obtaining a biomarker. And those hypothesis-driven projects, so these are projects that are dedicated towards typically a single molecule or a group of molecules that we know has a predictable function that's associated with the disease of interest versus an exploratory approach, which is something more that um, our lab does. And what this is doing is really casting a big net with thousands of potential genes or thousand potential markers that we can evaluate at a given so a point in time to find underlying information that otherwise we would have missed. Next is the relevance of that biomarker. And again, that comes down to understanding uh, normal versus abnormal, both with disease process and functionality and that biomarker um, that we're really interested in. And then what indications and associations that biomarker has with the outcome of disease and those clinical endpoints. And the last step, and arguably the most important, is the validation of that biomarker. And again, that comes down from that science forward approach. That uh, validation comes from repeatedly finding that biomarker um, in a multitude of different animals, typically hundreds of thousands, and it being highly accurate in representing the disease that we're truly interested in. And so as I said previously, we really don't have a lot of uh, biomarkers in terms of predicting BRD or that prospective diagnosis of BRD. Um, I've listed four kind of classical things that we use up here to indicate disease or disease uh, risk. Um, things like serum cortisol, change in average daily gains or body weights, rectal temperature and acute phase proteins, mainly haptoglobin. The problem is, is that 
um, even those historical markers that were often or still often used, they lack uh, diagnostic accuracy. They're not very specific to biological functionality that's associated with disease. Uh, for example, serum cortisol is a stress response. Uh, the animal doesn't have to be burdened with disease or specifically respiratory disease for it to be stressed. So again, this can lead to a lot of false positives. None of them uh, really have any type of spatial relationships with the disease process itself. And no matter what, there's no temporal association. What this means is that these things are not gonna tell us at what time or what stage of disease that animal's in. So this is an opportunity to kind of go into a newer approach that we're targeting. And, and this comes down to start, at least with the Francis Crick dogma. So this is back in biology, where we learned that DNA transcribes into RNA, and that RNA then translates into some functional product like a protein. Um, and so we're really interested in the RNA, and we're using these RNA-seq models, and this is short for RNA sequencing models, to evaluate RNA. And we do this by sequencing and analyze um, all the RNA that's in or between samples. Specifically, we're using blood. And this is kind of a culmination of a lot of uh, fancy mathematical algorithms and statistical approaches, uh, uh, computer science and biology. And ultimately, what we're doing with this is we're taking that information that we gain from these differentially expressed genes, these RNAs, um, as a proxy of defining genomic mechanism um, and protein synthesis or regulation at a given point in time. And this is really powerful because we can, again, depict and cast kind of a wide net and depict thousands of different biological events and, bio and, and genes and potential candidate biomarkers simultaneously at a point in time. And then what that does is it allows us to capture and visualize a lot of biological complexity that's taking point um, at any given time. So particularly, we're looking at genes at arrival. And that's allowing us to understand information that we can both hypothesize and I feel is more importantly, um, allow us to find unexpected features that otherwise we would have missed. So to start, why are we even interested in these arrival blood transcriptomes? And so why are we utilizing whole blood? And realistically, it's a very easy to obtain uh, non-invasive sample. So compare this to things like lung biopsy, which may tell us a lot about what's happening down in the lungs at the time of arrival, is very invasive. So often, uh, if we're not having to do some kind of lung biopsy, we'll have to euthanize those animals. So that doesn't really work as a diagnostic tissue site. And blood's quite dynamic. As I said earlier, thinking about CBC and chemistries, it really represents a lot of system-wide changes that are happening across the body at a certain given time. And so we're evaluating gene expression at arrival, specifically looking for differentially expressed genes um, in animals that are rather associated with BRD development um, within 28 days following arrival or resistance or those animals that remain healthy and are never treated. And we're categorizing uh, those animals based on things like treatment frequency, clinical scoring, and average daily gains. And so we're really interested in emphasizing those healthy animals in those high-risk groups, those animals that are placed in high-risk groups but never actually getting sick. That's really important, along with identifying what's happening with animals that go on to develop BRD. And we're ranking that based on disease severity. So those animals that are only treated one time, uh, versus those animals that are treated at least two times or more and or eventually die um, of bovine respiratory disease. And so real quick, I just wanted to show everyone kind of what the metadata looks like. And I know this is a lot of information all at once. So really what I want you guys to focus on, on is uh, the things that are labeled in green here. And this is how we're kind of indicating disease and severity of disease. So you know, BRD, zero and one, whether or not they have disease, zero, no, one, yes. Um, average daily gains at days uh, 14 and then at the end of those trials and for this particular study, uh, these are animals at day 60. The number and frequency of treatments and then those clinical scores every time they were treated. We're using that information to kind of garnish uh, what level of or what cohort that these animals need to be placed in based on disease severity. And so what we're finding is those healthy animals, they seem to have uh, some of these potential protective processes enriched or active at arrival. Uh, one of those has to do with these specialized pro-resolving mediators or SPMs. These are also known as lipoxins or resolvins and uh, they're lipid molecules that are involved in quelling some of these pro-inflammatory signaling uh, functions within both macrophages and neutrophils. And what's really interesting about this is that SPMs have quite a bit of research that's been done with them in, in mice and also in humans. 
that's related to acute lung injury, and specifically patients that come into a hospital for sepsis or acute lung injury that have an increase in these SPMs that are being produced are less likely to undergo uh, severe clinical disease and, and eventual mortality than those that don't. Uh, another point in, is that these uh, molecules are induced through the metabolism of things like arachidonic acid, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and acetylsalicylic acid, or better known as aspirin. This is an important point because about 20 to 30 years ago, there was actually a fair bit of research that was looked into using aspirin as an adjunct therapy along with antimicrobial treatment for BRD, and it showed that the use of aspirin uh, decreased the frequency of treatments over time and the cost of treatment over time. And at the time, everyone thought it had to do with COX-2 modality, kind of the typical thing with non steroidal anti-inflammatories, but actually what's being shown in more recent literature is that aspirin is actually inducing the production of these SPMs. And then last, also what we're finding in these animals that remain healthy um, has to do with angiotensinogen metabolism. So first you read that and you think, okay, blood pressure, this has to do with the kidneys. Actually what we're finding is the genes that are associated with this particular mechanism have to do with regional mast cells and their ability to regulate fibrin and increase in angiogenesis within the lungs themselves. And so next, this is just looking at kind of an overview uh, computational look at those functional products. So this is the proteins that are associated with those genes and the known and predicted interactions that are taking place. And again, these are all gene products that are being upregulated in those healthy animals. And this is just illustrating the functionality of those genes. And so now moving to those animals that do develop disease, again, ranking them based on severity and frequency of treatment. So those animals that are only treated one time um, and otherwise do okay. They have the same relative average daily gains to the end of the studies as those animals that remain healthy. Um, at arrival, they have antimicrobial peptide production that's increased. Um, this is really interesting because these are directed peptides that are against bacteria, and these peptides are naturally produced by the host. Um, then the other pathway that we're really interested in that's associated with genes that we're finding is uh, has to do with airway keratinization. So this is a process in which um, the upper respiratory tract, specifically the epithelium of the upper respiratory tract, has kind of this anti-necrotic secondary back, a barrier against pathogens, and it also enhances activity. So ultimately, this pathway may be preventing premature cell death that's occurring within the upper respiratory tract. And then those animals that do really poorly, those animals that are treated twice or more and or die uh, due to bovine respiratory disease, what we're finding is that arrival, these animals will typically have an antiviral mechanism um, that's being upregulated, specifically related to type 1 interferon productions or interferon alpha and betas. Um, and it's been shown in, in previous research that viral disease is often associated with a worse outcome related to bovine respiratory disease. Um, so it may be that these animals that have this upregulation of antiviral mechanisms uh, may not respond well at all to an metaphylaxis. And then the last pathway we're really interested in, and this actually trends with disease severity, is the activation of the alternative pathway of complement, um, specifically with uh, complement factor B. And so uh, what's really interesting is that the alternative pathway of complement doesn't require an antibody for its induction and enhancement. So it could be that these animals don't have things like broad, uh, broad neutralizing antibodies at arrival that help kick on uh, more classical pathways of complement. And so what we have here, uh, again, this is starting in A. This is the functional associations or the protein network that's associated with this type 1 interferon gene. So this is just showing that those genes really have a tight network in terms of their interactions with one another. And on the right in B here, what we see is there's a lot of dots that are associated here. This is a co-expression analysis. So what this is showing us is that uh, these genes that are related to type 1 interferon productions are being co-expressed simultaneously. So we're not just getting one particular gene that's regulated based on the indu uh, induction or the production of interferon alpha and beta. We're getting several that are co-expressed simultaneously. So this last slide is looking at the uh, ROC curves that were performed with the, uh, the AUCs or the area under the curves. And so this was a, a means of a, addressing how well some of those top genes that we found across three different populations are able to predict accurately uh, with expected sensitivities and specificities, how well they can place animals 
um, into the BRD treat one uh, or treat two or healthy cohort based on the expression of those six genes. And what we have here are really high AUC. So again, the closer to one that gets, uh, the the more sensitive and specific those those hypothetical three marker panels are for pre accurately predicting health outcome uh, at arrival. So with that, just to wrap everything up, um, I'd like to thank you guys uh, again for having me out here. Uh, the work presented here, I think, is part of the future in terms of uh, pre precision agriculture and predictive diagnostics, at least in beef cattle at arrival. And hopefully within the next few years, I'll be able to come back here and discuss some of these markers in a much more broader use with a lot more samples and, and really uh, attempt to validate them. So thanks again. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Scott. I'm a Okay, so I think uh, what we what I'd like to do is for everyone to kind of hold their questions that uh, they might have regarding Matt's uh, presentation. And I think that, you know, one of my questions is I, I'd like to get some clarity on on the time between when these uh, when these biomarkers were found and when these animals actually became ill, so uh, I'm mean, I'm going to I'm going to be asking him that, but but I think that uh, you know again it's sort of a, an interesting thing to start looking at these uh, at the possibility of finding something at arrival that you can actually use to predict the animals that are going to get sick and pretty interesting work. The next presenter that we have is uh, Dr. Good evening, uh, Dr. Will Crosby, and uh, <clears throat> Will is a is a veterinarian, graduated from Mississippi State last year, and is uh, is a, is pursuing a PhD uh, with Dr. Willems. Uh, he's working on uh, so his work is is pretty new. He's just getting started, I think, and uh, he's current. He's looking at uh, the anti antimicrobial resistance in Mannheimia hemolytica and how metaphylaxis and uh, affects. Uh, antimicrobial resistance, morbidity, and mortality. And uh, thank you for coming to listen to this talk. My name is Will Crosby. I want to talk about antimicrobial resistance in Mannheimia hemolytica and the effects of metaphylaxis on that, as well as morbidity and mortality in, in stalker calves, which is part of my PhD research. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking you know, about background because I'm sure. And high hemolytica is a bug are all familiar with, but I do want to talk about a couple details. I'm sure you all all know it's the most common bacterial pathogen isolated in beef cattle with PRD and acts as normal nasal flora most of the time in healthy cattle, but then becomes an opportunistic pathogen when it moves the lungs after damage to the host immune system. The, the part I want to focus on is that genotype here because um, recently it's been characterized into genotype 1 and genotype 2 with genotype 2 being All right, everybody just hold on a moment. Good evening, everyone. One. Thank you for coming to listen to this talk. My name is Will Crosby. I want to talk about antimicrobial resistance in Mannheimia hemolytica 
and the effects of metaphylaxis on that, as well as morbidity and mortality in, in stalker calves, which is part of my PhD research. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about background because I'm sure Mannheimia hemolytica is a bug you're all familiar with, but I do want to talk about a couple details. I'm sure you all, all know it's the most common bacterial pathogen isolated in beef cattle with HRD and acts as normal nasal flora most of the time in healthy cattle, but then becomes an opportunistic pathogen when it moves the lungs after damage to the host immune system. The, the part I want to focus on is the genotype here because um, recently it's been characterized into genotype 1 and genotype 2 with genotype 2 being more associated with bovine respiratory disease and antimicrobial resistance. And speaking of things that are all, I'm sure, very familiar with, um, there's been increasing prevalence of antimicrobial resistant strains in Mannheimia hemolytica. Um, as, as well as multidrug resistant Mannheimia hemolytica, especially over the last 10 years or so. And I've just listed a couple studies that had high levels of multidrug resistant Mannheimia isolated. There's also been a mobile genetic element, or, and, and specifically an integrative conjugative element, or ICE, that can contain multiple antimicrobial resistant genes. Um, discovered in both pastoral multosta and in Hymia hemolytica. Uh, this ice has also been associated with genotype 2 in Hymia hemolytica. And so the major research questions that I'm trying to answer is, does the administration of long-acting macrolide at arrival increase selection for antimicrobial resistant strains of Mannheimia hemolytica? And, and you may be sitting there you know, asking why we're, we're wondering this, because obviously we give a lot of metaphylaxis and we get a lot of antimicrobial resistant or multidrug resistant menhymia from the from these calves. Um, but really there have not been any published controlled studies where one group was of calves was given metaphylaxis and, and one group was not, and, and that was the only difference between the groups. Um, so that's um, the, the design of my study, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. The next question is, does metaphylaxis affect um, the, the community of bacteria that are living in the nasopharynx or the, or the microbiome and the presence of antimicrobial resistance genes within that, within that community and not just in Mannheimia hemolytica? Uh, because there's been more and more evidence that it's not necessarily um, the presence of one particular bug that might cause the problem but the, the balance of that bug plus other bacteria that live there. So the overall goals are determine the effect of metaphylaxis on the classical culture and sensitivity techniques where we can find the phenotypic uh, antimicrobial susceptibility of Mannheimia, as well as look at the presence of and microbial resistance genes through whole genome sequencing in any Mannheimia hemolytica isolates we find. We also want to determine the effect of metaphylaxis on that nasopharyngeal microbiome or community through sequencing of all the genomes that are there. And this is metagenomic sequencing. And, and last, we want to identify the presence of Mannheimia hemolytica and that ice in, in the total bacterial DNA that's there through um, quantitative PCR. So our hypothesis is that administration of telathromycin metaphylaxis will lead to increased prevalence of antimicrobial resistant and multiply resistant isolates of Mannheimia hemolytica in the nasopharynx of stalker calves. It'll also have increased presence of resistance genes in the bacterial community and a change in the families that make up that community. Now I want to talk about the big picture study design and then I will talk about last fall's trial and some of the results from that. So overall each trial is going to consist of 80 recently weaned stalkers purchased from regional 
markets, which are randomly assigned to groups to receive um, telathromycin at arrival or not. This will be done over four total trials leading to 160 calves that received metaphylaxis at arrival and 160 calves that received no antibiotics at arrival. They'll all be sampled at day zero, and that was before they received metaphylaxis, and then again at day 20 to 21. They are also sampled um, if they receive antimicrobial treatment during the study period for, for any illness, including BRD, but could be things for things such as foot rod or pink eye. Um, I'll put this slide in there um, in case a picture is more helpful than all those words, which it is for me. So at day zero, all the calves are swabbed with deep nasopharyngeal swabs for culture and for DNA extraction, and then assigned to a group to receive metaphylaxis or not. Um, they're then put into pens with no fence line contact and monitored for illness for the next 21 days. And any calves requiring antimicrobial treatment are also swabbed, again, both for culture and DNA extraction, and moved to a separate pen. So by day 21, when they're, they're swabbed for the last time, we have four pins, again, that don't have fence line contact. That's those that received metaphylaxis but did not get sick over the treatment period, and those that received metaphylaxis and had illness, and then the same two groups for the ones that initially did not receive metaphylaxis at arrival. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, last fall's trial. And I will say that this is preliminary data, but we don't have all the results for some of the tests yet. So um, the objectives that I'm going to talk about today um, were to compare the prevalence of Mannheimia hemolytica in the calves that received metaphylaxis to those that did not, and also compare the morbidity and mortality due to BRD uh, in the calves that received metaphylaxis to those that did not. Again, this is a little bit more specific, but it's the same general methods that I talked about earlier. We used recently weaned beef breed heifers that were around 450 pounds at arrival, and they were obtained from again, local auction markets, and we had 84. They were randomly assigned to two groups before arrival, and half of them received metaphylaxis at the label dose of telatromycin or draxin and then half received no antibiotics. All the other processing was the same. And again, I will note that, I wanna note that um, nasopharyngeal swabs were taken from each nostril before the administration of metaphylaxis, and they were paired together and then put in modified image transport media. And then we also had another pair of swabs, again, one from each nostril paired together for DNA extraction. After processing, calves were separated by a group into pastures with no fence line contact and then monitored daily for signs of any illness. And like I said, any that received antimicrobials for any reason were swabbed again and moved to two new separate pastures, um, again with no fence line contact. Um, in, in this study, just due to scheduling and availability of the shoot, they were swabbed again on day 20 instead of day 21. And like I said, by this time we had four groups, um, the metaphylaxis and no metaphylaxis groups that did not require antimicrobial treatment during the study period, and then the two groups that did require treatment with antimicrobials due to illness. As far as processing those culture swabs, they were put on the blood auger plates and any colonies consistent um, with uh, appearance, uh, phenotype, and biochemical test of Mannheimia were subplated, and then isolates stored for both the future susceptibility testing as well as whole genome sequencing. We also struck a plate with those subplates that were submitted for MALDI to do not to confirm the Mannheimia hemolytic ID as well as obtain our genotype. Um, for people less familiar with MALDI, it's a uh, newer technique, but it's becoming more available at 
an increasing number of diagnostic labs that um, can determine at the species level uh, the species of bacteria and for as far as menheimia it can actually determine the um, genotype based on the different mass spectra between the two genotypes. Now for statistical methods we used SAS and we did a chi-square test between group and whether or not the calf was treated with antimicrobials, um, so our morbidity, and between group and whether or not menheimia was isolated and what genotype was isolated at all time points. So that would be day zero at the time of antimicrobial treatment and at day 21, or 20 in this case. Now we're getting into results, two calves, and that was one from each group were hospitalized um, for reasons other than BRD. Um, and since they had an extended stay in the hospital, and actually I think they ended up being grouped together just for space and convenience, they were removed, to this, removed from the study um, because they had different antimicrobial um, exposure and they did have contact with each other and potentially other calves. Over the 20-day study period, there were 20 calves treated with antimicrobials, um, so leading to the metaphylaxis plus treatment group having an N of 11, and then no metaphylaxis, but having an antimicrobial treatment during the study period having an N of nine. Out of that 20, 17 or 85% were treated for bovine respiratory disease. Um, and that led the meta plus treatment for BRD being nine out of those 11 calves, so 82%, and the no meta plus treatment for BRD being eight out of nine or 89%. So this table is the isolation rate of Menheimia hemolytica via culture for each group at each time point. Um, you'll notice at day zero, there was a significant difference of isolation rate um, between the meta and no meta calves with 10 out of the 12 isolates being from the metaphylaxis group and only two out of the 12 being from the no meta group. Um, had a p-value of 0 0.0158. I just want to remind everybody that these swabs were taken before metaphylaxis. So this is not a treatment effect. It's a difference in our groups demographically, even though we did randomly assign them to, to groups. We had an overall isolation rate at day zero of 15%, which is about what we would expect. And at treatment, only four out of the 20 calves that were treated with antimicrobials were positive for Mannheimia hemolytica on culture, with three of those being from the no meta group and one being from the meta group. At day 20, um, we had a overall isolation rate of 40%. Again, we, we expected that to go up, and that's with what we might expect, with 20 out of the 32 being from the metaphylaxis group and 12 out of the 32 being from the no meta group. When it comes to genotype, at day zero, the, the majority of isolates were genotype one, and as the, the study period went on, we had more genotype two. Um, at treatment, three out of the four in Jaime Hemolytica isolates were genotype two. And at day 20, all of the isolates were genotype two. So to finish up the results, our chi-square analysis did show a significant difference between groups when it comes to arrival isolation rate of Mannheimia hemolytica. I do want to emphasize this was not due to the metaphylaxis because these swabs were obtained before administration of Draxin. Um, this is a difference in the groups demographically despite our random selection. However, there was no significant association between metaphylaxis and whether or not a calf ended up being treated during the time, during the study period whether or not Mannheimia hemolytica was isolated at any other time point or the 
genotype of Menheimian hemolytica that was isolated. Also noteworthy, most of the, the calves were not positive at multiple time points. Only one heifer from each group was positive for Menheimian hemolytica at day zero and day 20. And both of these were genotype one on day zero and genotype two on day 20, which is, I think, interesting. So in conclusion, there was no significant association between metaphylaxis and morbidity. Um, the Menheimia isolation at any time point other than at day zero or the genotype of Menheimia hemolytica isolated. Uh, we should note that groups not have identical rates of isolation of Menheimia hemolytica at arrival. And we're, we're unsure of the effect that that will have at this time, but that brings me to the future work you know, which I've already described a little bit, that future trials are planned to see if these effects are reproducible and it should hopefully reduce the effect of the uneven distribution of Menheim and Hemolytica at arrival in this group. Antimicrobial susceptibility testing is ongoing and we're looking forward to the results of that. And we're also going to compare the presence of antimicrobial resistance genes in the Menheimia, we isolated through whole genome sequencing, as I talked about. And, and again, I already mentioned this, but our, our goals are also to compare the microbiome and the resistance. So that's the presence of all resistance genes in a, a microbial community uh, through the shotgun managed genomic sequencing. So finally, I'd like to make some acknowledgments first. Uh, Larry Ballard and Angela Knight in our diagnostic lab for helping go over those plates and answering a lot of the questions I had when looking at those plates and isolating the Menheimia hemolytica. Uh, my PhD committee consisting of my PI, Dr. Willems, as well as Dr. Karish and Dr. So here at Mississippi State, Dr. Paul Morley at Texas A&M and West, West Texas A&M Vero Center, and Dr. Jonathan Fry at the USDA ARS in Georgia. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone else in the Williams lab, as well as the students that happen to be on the food animal medicine rotation while we were processing calves and helping with that and all the sample collection, because um, wouldn't have been able to do it without a lot of help. And, and finally, the USDA NEFA understanding antimicrobial resistance program grant for funding. And I'll finish with leaving my contact information up here and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you, Will. We'll hold the questions for just a little bit um, and we'll um, get to the next presentation and then we'll come back to questions kind of in total. Uh, the next presentation that I'd like to introduce is going to be um, given by uh, Dr. Marilee Thorson. Uh, Marilee is a um, uh, Hello. is a um, works for us as a laboratory manager and a researcher. Um, she is she works uh, uh, predominantly in our infectious disease and immunology lab and uh, works predominantly for Dr. Willems. Um, and so we've seen we've seen two um, two bodies of work uh, that have focused mostly on well focused on bovine respiratory disease. This particular work is pretty new. It's just gotten started, but it's uh, looking at um, looking at the use of mRNA. Uh, therapy and vaccines uh, on mucosal surfaces, and the model here is Trichomonas fetus. So it's a little bit of a different, uh, quite a different, actually, um, 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 application of the of the of 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 messenger RNA. But it's it's very it's a very interesting application that we uh, we're very excited about, and Marilee is going to uh, introduce it for us. Thanks so much for having me here to speak at the Merck Animal Health and Mississippi State University College of Veterinary Medicine 
stalker veterinary meeting. The title of my talk is Synthetic mRNA Transfection Induces Expression of Antibodies Against Tritrichomonas Fetus Surface Antigen, TF1.17. Infected bulls have a limited immunologic response to the protozoal urogenital parasite T fetus. As a result, they become chronically infected but lack clinical signs and are asymptomatic carriers. In females, infection results in reproductive failure, and while they can clear infection, immunity is short-lived, generally less than six months, and they're prone to reinfection. There is a lack of consensus regarding the value of the only available vaccine. Currently, the disease is largely managed by screening and culling infected bulls. It is estimated through a simulation model that, for, that trichomoniasis can causes a 14 to 50% reduction in annual calf crop and a 5 per cow. In Texas, cow calf producers were estimated to have lost $95 million annually and as much as $156 million when feedlocks were also included in this analysis. Currently, there are no USDA or FDA approved treatments for bovine trichomoniasis. The use of mRNA as a therapeutic is a rapidly evolving field. In particular, we are interested in use, utilizing it to stimulate mucosal immunity. Aerosol delivery of synthetic mRNA can be used to induce transient protein expression. When synthetic MR, mRNA is sprayed onto cells or tissues, it is taken up and the encoded protein is expressed. The target protein can be a reporter such as G. GFP or green fluorescent protein or nanoluc, an antibody, an antimicrobial peptide, or any other protein that could potentially be therapeutic. The bottom line is that cells can be induced to produce proteins they might not normally express to prevent or treat disease. Two recent studies where mRNA therapy was utilized to stimulate mucosal immunity involved first the lung aerosol administration of mRNA encoding for a neutralizing antibody against respiratory syncytial virus that protected mice from infection. In collaboration with the researchers that conducted this murine study, we delivered aerosolized mRNA to the sheep cervicovaginal mucosa and induced expression of the broadly neutralizing antibody PGT-121, which was directed against HIV. This bottom figure is from that publication, and the top panel is a black and white image of the female reproductive tract of two sheep that were treated 24 hours previously with aerosolized mRNA that encoded for the BGDT121 antibody and also was tagged with nanoluc. So this bottom panel shows that nanoluc signal in those tissues when they were treated with the substrate and then imaged, imaged via IVIS. These sheep were treated with four sequential sprays of mRNA along the length of the reproductive tract. And we can see by these red areas that we have these focalized levels of high target protein production uh, and with the surrounding tissues also producing the antibody that they were transfected to express. So based on the results of this study with the sheep, we felt that this approach could be highly applicable to developing a novel therapy to treat bovine trichomoniasis. A synthetic mRNA encoding for antibody against T fetus could be applied to the prepuce and penis of bulls to provide mucosal immunity at the site of infection. Other researchers have shown that bulls vaccinated with whole cell antigens had IgG1 against T fetus in their serum and their prepucial secretions, as well as IgG1 plasma cells in their prepuce, and that as a result, they were resistant to infection upon challenge with T fetus. While our understanding of why bulls fail to mount a protective antibody response to T fetus is limited, we do know that cellular attachment is central to the infection and pathogenesis of this disease. TF1.17 is a cell surface antigen involved in adhesion to host mucosa. So it's essential to establishing attachment and subsequent pathogenesis in this disease. 
TF1.17 therefore is a potential target for mRNA therapy. In a previous study, treatment of T fetus with uh, two monoclonal antibodies against the cell surface antigen resulted in immobilizing the parasites, inducing complement mediated killing, and decreased attachment to bovine vaginal epithelial cells in vitro. These two monoclonal antibodies, known as TF1.15 and 1.17, are against two epitopes of the TF1.17 antigen. These two monoclonal antibodies, TF1.15 and 1.7, were produced by hybridoma cell lines that were generously given to our laboratory by Dr. Nolanette Corbet. These hybridomas were expressing a murine IgM isotope of these antibodies, and we cultured, expanded them, and submitted them for DNA sequencing. That sequencing was used to engineer synthetic mRNAs encoding for expression of a bovine IgG1 isotope of these monoclonal antibodies against TF1.17. Our transfection studies were conducted in 24 well plates that were seeded with bovine kidney cells and established cell line or primary prepucial keratinocytes that we isolated from tissues from bulls. They were seeded in those 24 well plates and then they were transfected with one microgram per well of that synthetic mRNA for either of those constructs, TF1.15 or 1.7 and messenger max was used as a transfection reagent. We also had carrier only controls and green fluorescent protein mRNA for negative and positive controls respectively. At 24 hours following transfection, we harvested the cell culture supernatants and fixed the cells with 4% PFA for uh, an immunofluorescence assays. Everything was done in triplicates for, uh, for both the transfections and the controls. And then again, we repeated the cell culture supernatant and cell fixation at 48 hours as well. For IFA of the fixed cells, we permeabilized and blocked the transfected and control cells, incubated them with diluted secondary antibody, which was an antibiovine IgG conjugated to dilate 594, DAPI counterstain and mounted the cover slips. To look at binding of these antibodies against T fetus, we cultured and fixed the parasites, dried them on slides, then blocked them, incubated them with supernatants from those cell culture, those transfected cells or, the, or with bovine IgG as a negative control, and then we incubated them with a diluted secondary, same as for the cells, and DABI countersand and mounted them. Turning towards our results, this shows um, images of cells 24 hours post-transfection with the TF1.17 construct, and on the left, we have bovine kidney cells. On the right, we have the transfected bovine keratinocytes. And the insets are carrier-only controls. And the red labeling throughout the cytoplasm around the DAPI stain nuclei in both cell lines is indicative of the cells expressing the target protein, TF1.17, 24 hours post-transfection, um, as compared to the carrier-only controls where we do not see any of this labeling. It should be mentioned that we do also see labeling at 48 hours. However, as the cells become apoptotic over the transfection cycle and start lysing and uh, releasing their cell contents into the media, we tend to start seeing less staining uh, of the cells at that time, at that latter time point in the transfection cycle. So this is looking at 48 hours, and now we're looking at the supernatants from the TF1.17 transfected cells that are now being, have been incubated with the whole cell T fetus. On the left, we have the cell culture supernatants from the bovine kidney cells, and on the right, we have the supernatants from the bovine keratinocytes, and the insight is a negative control, which were uh, trick incubated with bovine IgG only. And here we see, looking on the left, that we are getting binding against the surface of the whole cell T fetus. Um, and it's also occurring with the supernatants from the keratinocytes, though it does seem to be less extensive uh, based on the appearance of these two uh, slides. Uh, we did not measure antibody levels in the supernatants yet, but it could be that the bovine kidney cells are being more efficiently transfected and expressing more target. So that is why we're seeing what appears to be more abundant labeling against the trick. 
when we're looking at uh, cell culture supernatants from the bovine kidney cells as compared to the keratinocytes. This is looking at basically the same data we just reviewed, but now for the TF1.15 uh, mRNA construct, the top panel is images of the cells or controls at 24 hours. Again, we can see the labeling in the cytoplasm accumulating in the cells for both the BK cells and the keratinocytes. Of course, we don't see labeling in our negative controls. And then at 48 hours, when we look at incubating these uh, cell culture supernatants with those whole cell T fetus, we are seeing labeling against the T fetus or binding of the antibody in those supernatants, um, both when we look at the bovine kidney supernatants and the keratinocytes. Though again, it does appear that the keratinocyte labeling is um, more uh, extensive as compared to the keratinocytes. And then finally, we don't see uh, labeling of trick cultured or uh, incubated with the bovine IgG only. Okay, to sum summarize our results, um, IFA of both cell lines showed labeled uh, monoclonal antibody TF1.15 and 1.7 in their cytoplasm at 24 hours post-transfection. Whole cell T fetus incubated with 48 hour post-transfection cell culture supernatants showed binding of these antibodies to their cell surface. And together, these observations confirm that the transfected cells were producing bovine IgG1 antibodies against T fetus cell surface antigen TF1.17. Based on uh, the results we presented here today, uh, we were able to successfully transfect bovine epithelial cells to express monoclonal antibodies against um, the TF1.17 cell surface antigen. Previously, when T fetus were treated with those mon these monoclonal antibodies, researchers observed a decrease in attachment and parasite viability in vitro. Um, and therefore, it is hoped that with aerosol application of a synthetic mRNA coding for these antibodies directly to the urogenital epithelium of bulls, we could potentially prevent or eliminate infection by stimulating local, local mucosal immunity at the site of infection. In the future, we would like to uh, assess the viability of T fetus uh, when they're treated with the purified uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, TF1.15 and 1.17, both with and without complement. We would like to optimize the transfection of prepucial skin explants, which you see here in this 24 well dish. Uh, and then finally, we would like to evaluate parasite attachment and viability when we co-culture the parasites with transfected cells or skin explants, uh, essentially establishing an in vitro uh, challenge system. This lower right hand corner is a video of a trick cultured with uh, bovine prepucial keratinocytes. And we start the video, we can see the rounded parasites that are already attached, as well as uh, these two here that are just attacked by one anterior flagellum. And so they're still modile at this point. Um, and Basically, uh, we would like to just continue to work with the system and refine it uh, in our future work. To conclude, I want to acknowledge, first of all, the funding for this research, the Chris Grant Program, administered by the Mississippi State University CVM and USDA. I want to also thank both the Willems and the Santangelo Labs, and a huge thanks to Dr. Lynette Corbet for gifting us the two cell lines that which without which we could not have even begun this research. So we just cannot thank her enough for giving us those cell lines and letting us pursue this area of research. And finally, uh, I also wanna thank the organizers and hosts of the Merck CVM stalker meeting. And finally, this is just the literature that was cited during uh, the course of this presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, if, if we could, uh, we've got Matt and Will and Mary Lee on the, on the line. Um, our, uh, <laughs> Are there uh, any questions for um, 
uh, regarding regarding uh, these last three presentations. If you have some questions, we can put it in the chat box. I've got a couple questions already. Um, and Matt, I had a question on, you know, can you can you describe the timeline between when you collected your samples for your your blood samples and the time that the animals became ill? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, funny enough, I actually pulled up the metadata just so I, I was fairly accurate in what I was saying. So, across the three populations of studies that we did, so this was uh, animals out of 2015, 2017, and 2019, average time to first treatment, uh, so from when day zero or arrival to when they were first receiving the antimicrobial, was between seven and eight days. And those three studies really didn't see a significant difference. Uh, between the time of uh, treatment. Um, I think the earliest animal we had was we treated a day after arrival, but pretty much everybody else was in within the first, first uh, kind of that late, late to that first week to the second week. Okay. Okay, so, um, so the significant, or the, the application of this work, Matt, really is, is what to, I mean, we're not going to do RNA-seq on calves at the shoot, but what is it that you hope to, you know, what could be an end product or an end, end point? Well, maybe one day we'll see what's in that issue. Who knows? So, um, <laughs> so really what this was, was it was the concept of it was instead of looking at, at kind of the, the biomarkers, like things like haptoglobin and, and serum amyloid A and things like that, is there something in the blood that otherwise we're missing? Um, Okay, so it could be that you could discover some other targets, and it could be a whole a portfolio of targets that you might uh, that you might be able to use to to be more specific and more sensitive, perhaps, in identifying animals to become ill. Yeah, yeah and what this this is telling us, and what it's kind of leading into is it's kind of bimodal. Is we're developing something that we can potentially use as, as a means of prediction. Um, of course, we still have longitudinal studies to follow up on a lot of these markers we're interested in. Um, but at the same time, a lot of these pathways are discussed in, in, in quite some magnitude and in a lot of human literature uh, and their potential for therapeutic modality. So another concept we're looking at is, you know, some of these animals that otherwise have low levels of genes or pathways that are associated with good outcomes. Is there anything we can do to manipulate the expression of those pathways that otherwise may mitigate disease? So there is potential for kind of these mRNA therapies in the future, um, looking at many of these pathways that we've identified. Okay, all right. Will, I had a, I ha had a question come through on, what is the significance of the change from genotype one predominance early to genotype two predominance early? Is, is there something, can, can you interpret that? What's that mean? Yeah, um, it, it is interesting. Um, what what it's kind of seeming like right now um, is that difference between like serotypes at arrival and then later on um, the serotype changing to that type one um, later on in the feeding period. But it, it's not necessarily the same thing. Um, what I can tell you is the genotype two is is the one that's more associated with bovine respiratory disease. Now, not all those calves that we got genotype two from were sick, um, but it's also been associated with at least at least one one subtype in genotype two um, is associated with um, the antimicrobial resistance genes in that ice. So it could be that they're getting more exposure to whether there's there's horizontal gene transfer of that mobile genetic element that's changing them to genotype two, um, possibly or or really. The answer is not 100% sure, but there are a couple a couple different things that could be happening. Okay. Okay. And and Marilee, I guess um, I guess um, you you might have alluded to it or you might have said something to it, but it 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 appears like you can uh, you can you can elicit uh, antibody responses in cells to these uh, messenger RNA uh, particles 
Uh, and it appears you can do it in vivo in sheep, and it appears you can do it um, in in vitro in a trichomoniasis model. And I guess the question is, is, is do you have any idea on the duration of that effect in in vivo? Um, in the sheep, we studied it out actually a few, even as much as a few months. So um, actually, we did see sustained expression over the long term in tissues, in cell, in a cell culture system, in a lab, in a monolayer, you're only going to see about two days. So uh, the cells are pretty spent after 48 hours of transfection. So that's why actually an in vivo model system in a living animal, um, uh, it's it's a much more sustained level of expression. So uh, we actually look forward to trying to get to the point where we can be doing some in vivo work with actual bulls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so 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 the, so the work in in vivo is is exactly or in vitro is exactly what you would expect. So that I think that was that was important to important to point out. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any other questions for the for the uh, for the um, presenters today? If not, I want to thank each of you for presenting. I appreciate your, your updates on this kind of very important work. It's very cutting edge, so uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Marilee.